who in this room is a Java developer? Okay, thank you. That was for calibrating myself to 100%. Who has ever done any kind of Haskell or ML or Camel, Cecil? Oh, almost more than half of you. Awesome. We are addressing you. Frege is a Haskell for the JVM because, arguably, uh, Haskell is maybe not the best language design, but a masterpiece of language design. And the JVM is a masterpiece of engineering, and we are trying to bring both together. <laughs> My name is Dirk König, I work for Canoe in Basel, Switzerland. And for today, I'd like to run an experiment with you. We are going to program, all of you, because we haven't programmed enough today, and we should do every day. <laughs> and we will use the best computer ever, which is your brain. So, on to some dreaming of code. I will read you a program, and I will ask you what the purpose of that program is. The program has five lines of code and three variables, A, B, and C. Okay? Are you done? Are you set? And we have value semantics, and when I say A equals 1, it means the, the value 1 gets assigned to the variable A. Okay? So, we start. A equals 1. Got it? Good. Again, A equals 1. Now, B equals 2. C equals B. B equals A. A equals C. Shall I do it again? I'll do it again. Okay. A equals 1. B equals 2. C equals B. B equals A. A equals C. What's the purpose of that program? A swapping of two values. Thank you. Awesome. Hmm. Swapping of two values is a rather primitive operation. And we need quite a lot of sophistication to make that running in imperative code. So we stop dreaming and try to engineer that solution. So how does it look like? A equals 1, so we have the memory location for A being occupied by 1. B equals 2. C equals B, so A and B stay the same, and then what used to be in B, the value gets copied over to C, like so. This is what happened in your brain. You know? I'm reading your brain today. <laughs> Now, um, B gets the value of A, so A and C stay the same, but then the value from A gets copied over to B. And then again, B and C stay the same, and the value of C gets copied over to A. Well, that's, that's kind of the, what happened, well, the operational reasoning that we do when we read the code. But that's what we do all day, right? We are reading this kind of code, and what happens in our brain is this over here. And um, if this is difficult for you, then probably you wouldn't stay long in software engineering. We are a group of people that have proven to kind of master this kind of job. It is, it is an, uh, a task that you typically give to uh, a beginner in software engineering. But it's kind of hard. Why is it hard? Well, we have three different places that we care about, and we have three different points in time that we care about. How does it come that we have different points in time? Only because of these operations, of these assignments. When you have an assignment in your code, not the initial ones with the only definitions, but when you have assignments, they introduce the notion of time. Everything before the assignment and everything after the assignment. 
And therefore, we have in total nine different places, nine different states that we have to care about. Now, the typical human, and I'm not sure whether you qualify for that, <laughs> has a short-term memory of seven, plus minus two. You may have nine, I have five. I make up for the balance. You know? And that may be the reason why I'm not very good in this kind of test. Well, not only is it a bit difficult, it is actually kind of uh, surprising. And in the middle, we have this kind of state. If somebody from the outside looks at us, he has, sees an inconsistent state in between. So we have to shield that somehow. And even, even without the inconsistency, yesterday you said one and two, and today you say two and one. Is, are you lying to me or what? You know, it's kind of difficult. And to, in order to get our head around this kind of changing state and doing this operational reasoning, we need tools. Boof. This kind of operation is the main reason that we need a debugger. There are a few more reasons, but this is the main reason. Just recently, I have been explaining this to my parents. My mom is 75 years old, my father is 80 years old. And they have no technical training whatsoever. And I have explaining this, you know, with a coffee cup and glass of water and changing things. And they said, ah, oh, now we understand why this boy is kind of weird. <laughs> and I said, oh, you know, uh, wait, we, we figured something out. We can do it differently. And here it comes. We can use functions. And what we do is we take the A and the B and then we leave it like so and never change it again. Whoever looks at these two values will always see the same state. We do not change the state at all. Never. It stays there since eternal times. Done. Well, said my father, but you wanted to see it swapped over, right? I said, yes, seeing it swapped over is easy. So I took his glasses and said, well, imagine you have those prison glasses where things just flip over. And there you have it. And as many people can have as many glasses and look at the state in totally different ways, one sees it flipped over, one only sees the first one, one only sees the second one, one sees plus one times two, whatever, and they never interfere. If I would have told you in this initial example, uh, a comma b equals b comma a, he would have guessed it a little bit quicker. What we do. So this is why we are here. The idea is that we want to program just without assignments. You know, you can do. We are going for immutable state, and we are applying functions on top of it. So assignments are ruled out, we don't use them anymore, and assignments are just a special case of a statement, so we just, in one go, rule them out as well. And there's two ways of doing this. The blue pill and the red pill. For all of you that have not seen Haskell yet, you have only seen the blue pill. Which means, you know what, we impose some discipline on our developers. We just don't use this kind of state. We are marking everything final. And we are marking everything closed or var or whatever that is in your language. And we are not using any mutation at all. We are using immutable values. And you can apply this discipline. And the red pill is a new world. We use a purely functional language, where there isn't even an assignment, not even the syntax. It is impossible to express an assignment, because syntax just doesn't give it to you. Hmm, the question is, um, is that practical? Well, is, can we really work... Is, this new world, this red world, is it a good world, is it a bad world? Do, do we rather want to go back to the, to the simple and easy blue one? Well, let's see. 
I'll give you some code in, uh, in Frege, which Frege is a Haskell for the JVM, as you already know. And you can follow up. Um, you can follow along online with the online wrapper try.frege-lang.org. By the way, Frege is a bit difficult to pronounce in English. It's a German word, a German name, Frege. And if you're not a German native speaker, you're allowed to call that Freaky, if you want to. <laughs> so here it comes. Uh, in this first uh, example, let's define a function. Let's say a function, we're working in the REPL. I just pretend to work in the REPL. Times a, b, this is a function times, which takes two parameters, a and b, and the implementation is a times b. Not so surprising yet. Hmm? There seems to be no types, right? We haven't given any types. Is that untyped? Is that dynamically typed? No, we, as we will see, it's statically typed. Hmm, how do we call such a function? Well, if we say times two and three, and the, um, the notation for function application is the most quiet notation that you can think of. The operator for function application is white space. Very silent, you know? And it gives us six. Now, how about this type? What type is times of? What's the signature of times? If we ask the REPL, please give me the type of times, it says something crazy. What could this possibly be? Well, let's get some help. First of all, we said we declared no types in the very beginning. Well, then when we did the function application, the, the blank, between times and two is actually, it's an operator, function application operator, and it's left associative. Therefore, times two is the first expression that we evaluate, and whatever is the return value of that will be applied to three. That's it, so I, I've given you the extra parentheses that are superfluous because it's left associative. And now for the typing, the error marker, which denotes a function, is right associative. So what it actually says is exactly what we already inferred from the times two, which is that times two is a function that takes an argument, A, and returns a function that takes the other three, this one, and returns something of the same type. Now there's something in the front saying, well, this alpha that we have is not just any alpha, it must lie in the numeric type class. In Java, you would say it's an interface, right? Yeah. The so-called constraint. And also, as we can infer down here, like every function only has one parameter. We, only, we can only ever give one argument. A special thing. If you read this as a beginner, the typical rule of thumb is just, you know, the last one is return type and everything before it is just the arguments. But this kind of leaves you halfway um, on your understanding to, of what's happening here and why it is denoted as such. Let's proceed with this um, times two over here. We have seen times two is a special thing. It is a function that, that takes a numerical value and returns a function. Okay, how can we reference that? Well, this times two, we can even give it a name. Hmm, let's say two times. How can we call it? We can say two times three, obviously, and it gives us six. You see, I left something out over here, right? That's on purpose. We'll see that in a minute. So if we ask two times for its type, it says int to int. Why int to int and not num to num to num num num? Well, because we already know this one is an int and all the, all the other ones must be ints as well. And not subtypes of ints or so, must be ints from now on. So how does it come that we have this hole over here? Well, you could think of having a parameter in there. 
Well, the, the gray should say it's not really there, we just think it's there. Well, if we, if we had it, then this would just be an argument like normal, and this would be a normal function application as you know it from Java, right? But with this kind of purely functional language, you can work with your statements in your solution just like with equations in mathematics, you know? It's just like algebra. And if this was algebra, by the way, in algebra we denote multiplication with a blank character because it is a linear function, you know? It's like linear functions here. And in algebra, if this would be an algebraic equation, we can cancel out the x. We can divide by x on both sides. And this is actually what we do. Cancel out the x. You can do it mechanically. You can do it always in Haskell and in Frege, leaving you with a nice two times declaration, which kind of reads nice. Two times equals times two. Nice. This kind of almost partial application of a function is often called currying, in, um, with respect to Haskell Curry, who worked in this area, or Schönfinkling, who did the theoretical basis on that. Some people call it partial function application. There are subtle differences in that. And there is, uh, but actually, the person who first published about this, functions that take functions as arguments, functions that return functions, was Gottlob Frege in 1871. Hmm. So we used a function and used only part of it. Now we use many functions and compose them. How does that look like? Well, we could say two times and give it as an argument three times of two. Should get up 12, I hope. <laughs> so, but there's a second way of expressing this. And the second way is, well, we could have a function six times which is just the composition of two times and three times. Composition is denoted with a dot. You can also use Unicode character 2220, which is the middle dot. And then you can ask six times two and you will get 12 again. So what's the type? The type of six times is int to int. You guessed it. So what is the why can we write this as so? Because, as you know from high school math mathematics, this is somehow f of g of x. Right? And if you have f of g of x, you can make the composition of f and g and apply this to x. So the composition, make parentheses over here, and make this to x. And here would be the x as well. And we can cancel out the x, right? as we have seen in the previous slide. And what, what stays over here is six times is just the composition of two times and three times. So that's function composition. Functional languages give you all kinds of extra bits on how to manipulate functions, apply them partially, combine them, and so on. <clears throat> so we can deal with this function. We have a language which is made only out of functions. What do we gain? Well, a function in mathematics can only work on its arguments. It cannot do any state from the outside. It cannot capture any state. It has no observable side effects. You can call it as often as you want, always giving you the same result. That would be a pure function in mathematical terms. And we have that in Frege. How is it in Java? How is the Java method relate to this? So assume we have a method foo that takes a pair of types t and u and returns something of type t. What can it possibly do? Well, it most likely returns the first element of the pair, right? Okay. Could it return null? Yes, of course. Could it throw null pointer exception? Yes, of course. Could it write to system out? Yes, of course. Could it do logging? Yes, of course. Could it write it to the database? Yes, of course. Could it read it from the database? Yes, of course. Could it launch the missiles and start the Third World War? Yes, of course. Yeah. In contrary, in Frege, 
when we say we have a tuple, we have a pair of alpha, beta, and which returns alpha, there is only one possible sensible implementation of that, of that function, and this is returning the first element. Mainly because, in the first place, there is no null. There is no null point exception. We cannot make new values of alpha because we know nothing about alpha. Alpha is universally qualified. For all alpha, this is true. We cannot do anything else than returning alpha. Well, we could have endless computation or um, sudden existential failure of the world, you know, meltdown of the computer, something. Anything else, anything sensible, yeah, it can only return alpha. This is so strong that you can actually write a program that you feed it this signature and it will spit out the only possible implementation. And there are such programs. You can infer the implementation from the signature. In this special case, you cannot always do this. So, in Java, everything can possibly happen. We need to be careful. Not so for pure functions in Frege. Well, it's kind of nice. If you have a pure function which always returns the same value given the same arguments, hmm, you can cache the result and only do it once. It's called also memorization. Well, you can wait, well, it was requested over here, but you can wait until you really need the value and do it lazily, do lazy evaluation. Or you could, well, the computer is idle anyway, you could prematurely, you could, could preemptively, speculatively um, evaluate your values and have them readily available when they are needed. You can evaluate concurrently in this, or in parallel, and this is guaranteed to be 100% safe. No deadlocks, no race conditions, and so on. If you see times two, three over here, and times two, three over here, and times two, three over here, and times two, three over here in your code, you can refactor this and do it in one place. And this refactoring can be done by the compiler because it's clear to the compiler. The compiler knows it cannot possibly harm the evaluation. You could make IDEs that suggest these kind of operations, you know, these kind of refactorings, safe refactoring. If you have anything else, if you have like an, any other function, let's say um, system current time release, and you have multiple occasions, and, com and the IDE says, well, how about factoring this out in one place and only calculate that once? Possibly not what you want, right? So if you have purity, you can apply a huge amount of optimizations, and I'm waiting for the IDE vendors, who will be the first one to recognize this huge potential? Programming can be totally different in a few years if they only recognize this potential. Hmm. Now, in Java, right? You're, uh, you have a refactoring task, and we sometimes do this at Canoe. So, this is actually from one of our projects. The <laughs> we should refactor. Question was, uh, can, who, which, which kind of method that we call, and this calls the next method, and next method, and next method, where is the state change that introduced the bug? So, happy looking, right? <laughs> you have no idea where the state change is. So, it took like a week for going through the whole tree. It's not only, only this list, it is a whole tree of uh, function calls. Well, um, and then you kind of find it, or you convince yourself that this kind of code is flat safe, whatever, you can call it concurrently, okay. And then you call it concurrently. Because you have inspected it, there is no state change. And then tomorrow, the next programmer comes and makes a change there, right? In do create bean string blah bean object. He has no idea about your assumptions about this, right? And he will undermine your assumption. You have no idea of, of knowing, and he has no idea of knowing, because of all these silent assumptions in your code. If you have pure functions, 
you can use the type system to tell you. If the type system on the very top function would say you it's pure, it is guaranteed to be pure. And it wouldn't compile if anything down the call chain um, compromises the purity. Isn't that cool? Is that the silence of awe or is that the silence of, of misbelieving or so? I'm not quite sure. Well, this is what we can really do. I mean, it's a totally different world. We, are, we have taken the red pill, you know. Now, did we want to do this on the JVM? We have to interoperate with Java. And Java is, to a large extent, impure. Now, if you mix functional programming and object orientation in one language or in one paradigm, whatever, um, you don't really reap these benefits of pure functions. So the Frege approach is different, and as best I know, the, it's the only language on the JVM that goes that route. Do not mix, but make a clear demarcation. Let them combine, let them call each other, but make a clear demarcation. Here is OO, here is FP. Calling from Java to Frege is a no issue, right? Frege takes Haskell code, compiles it to Java source code first, so it's valid Java source code, and then uses Java C to compile it to bytecode. You can at any time look at the generated Java code. And from Java, you can call that Java code, of course. If you would ever want to know, what is the Java code representation of my current Frege Haskell code? You can, in the REPL, I can show you that afterwards, um, consult colon Java, and it gives you the Java code. Even pretty printed. Interesting is the other way around. So let's assume we would like to use um, Java net URL encoder dot encode which takes a string and encodes it in URL terms. Right? If you, you'd like to call it as encode der König and you have this, what is that, a plus or um, percent 20 or something and here this umlaut thing, so it, that should do it. Well, encode is of type string to string. It takes a string, it returns a string, it's pure. It has no side effects. We encode this assumption in the type system. There are many other methods in the, in the JDK, in, in your code, and in every in Java, uh, that are impure. How does that look like? So it has no purity on top here. We would like to call something called millis, and it is implemented as Java Lang system current time millis. Takes no arguments, actually the unit argument. I'll, get, I'll switch over that. And it returns not a long as in Java, but an I.O. long. This reads as it's an I.O. action. It is something that I can execute. And when I execute it, it will give me a long. And I can call it as millis or millis. But if I want to calculate with this one, like minus 1000, this will not compile. Because it, an I.O. long is not a long. I first, if I want to do this, I first have to enter this I.O. type or I.O. context, if you want. You have to enter the I.O. context, and then you can do your calculations. But then, once you enter it, you cannot escape anymore, and you yourself are I.O. Dirk or so, right? It's unescapable. Once you're tainted, it sticks with you. And this kind, this kind of declaration is the key distinction between Frege and many other JVM languages. It's actually the feature that got me sold on Frege. I said, well, this, this, somebody knows his craft who, is, who has been inventing this. So, long story short, from, if, when you call from Frege into Java, you can do this, but you can do, never do it unprotected. It's good, good rule in life, never do it unprotected. So, um, and you're, gonna, you're just as explicit about effects as you do in Haskell. So Haskell is between you, you will feel right at home. 
even if you call into Java. I mean, this is the key distinction, right? All other languages on the JVM, all the popular ones, go the route of saying, well, we have these guarantees. We have these maybe compile time guarantees, or we have these runtime guarantees. But once you call to Java, no guarantees whatsoever. How bad is that? Well, it's pretty bad, because how often do you call into Java? How often do you call Printlin? How often do you call something in Java? Well, all the time. Every second line is like so. Right? So this is a key distinction. Once you have this, you can do global type inference. I'm not going into too much detail here, but we have seen it with times two and three, a, time, a times b. Well, how clever must the system be that it can infer that this would work for every single numerical type. Not just for ints, not just for floats, but for numerical types. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And that's global. I mean, many languages have type inference, but it's always local. You have, if you give me the parameter types, then I give you the return type also. No, 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 it's global. If you don't want to, you don't need to give any types at all. Almost, right? But at some point, when you give the type, when you declare your type, the type inferencer will again do its work and will check your type against his type and said, well, if you are more specific, that's okay. But if you try to be more generic than I inferred, that's not allowed. How cool is that? So in the end, since we have mutable states, since we have I.O., since we have something that the program should do, the main function is, of course, dirty. The main function is of type I.O. something, right? If, the, if that is your thread stack from thread from left to right and then time from top to bottom. So you, have, you may have pure computations here and there, and they live in a sea of imperative code. So the color is on purpose. You know, it gets more and more dirty. <laughs> but the pure computations are like crisp thing yeah, but that we can hold on. There are threads safe by design. How cool is that? And these brown ones that you cannot escape, they are called monads. Be brave, get over it, they don't bite. It's just a name. If you initially think a context, that's good. You will later learn the mathematical mechanics behind it. So I'd now like to, to do some live coding with you. Uh, and that is the FISBUS contest. Who has ever heard about FISBUS? Oh, like half of you, thank you. So for the other ones, it's the, some people say a children's game, some people say a drinking game, uh, often used in interviews, job interviews. So the question is, please count one, two, three, four, five until 100. And for every third number, you say fizz. And for every fifth number, you say buzz. And if both comes together, you say fizz buzz. Well, the trick in an interview is not telling these numbers. It is making a program that does it, of course. So, um, Take a second. How would you do it? Here is an imperative solution. And until recently, I would have created such code myself. Right? It, is, um, it is Java, but that's an accident. So it could be any imperative language. I'm not bitching on Java here, not at all. Right? There are better solutions in Java also. So it's just, let's take it that's imperative. Well, you have to go from 1 to 100. First, there's this point when 3 and 5 come together. That's only every 15th. Okay, I have to take, for the, take that into account, and this must come first. And then either three or five, this could be swapped over, and the last one is that I print the number. Okay, okay so far? Who would have written it that way? Nobody, thank you. <laughs> 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 oh, 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 you're lying at me, I know. Anyway, so let's program this in Frege. Uh, is that visible? Okay. So the idea is, in an imperative language, 
uh, sorry, in a functional language, we can distinguish between uh, genera generating a data structure and using the data structure. So a typical data structure that we can use, if I see my cursor, would be the data structure of natural numbers, in the infinite stream of natural numbers that we can write as so. While well, this REPL, the read eval print loop, which is written in Frege and is using JavaFX uh, for display, is um, intelligent enough for not generating the infinite thing. You know? Because of lazy evaluation, we can actually limit um, the amount here. So what we can also do is we'd like to have them as strings. Okay? We'd like to have numbers so as strings. So we are mapping a function over the list of endless list. And the function that we map over is the show function. It's like two string in Java. Okay? Hmm. Numbers, how does it look like? Okay, sounds good. Now we need an abstraction for something like every third is a fizz. Okay, let's try with a list. First one, second one, third one is a fizz. How does that evaluate? To, the, to that. Okay. How do I make an endless repetition of that? Well, I can cycle over it. Hmm. Always write this wrong. Okay. Cycle. And we have fizz, 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 fizz. Nice. Endless, infinite stream of fizzes. We give it a name. Dizzies, you know, I'm dizzy. Physics equals that. Okay. So for buzzes, same thing, right? So buzzes, we, and now we are cycling. I could use repeat four or something, but I'm actually doing it this way and making a buzz. Don't forget. Okay, so how does buzzes look like? Buzz, 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 buzz. By the way, pay very close attention to what I'm doing. Now it comes. We would like to combine fizzes and buzzes. We have an endless stream of fizzes and we have an endless stream of buzzes. And we'd like to combine those into one endless stream which contains fizzes and buzzes. Now for that, we have a function called zip. It's like a zipper on your trouser. So it takes two. And you can uh, specify the function by which it should be uh, combined. That is called zip width. Zip width, and I'm not quite sure what, what's going to be the fizzes and the buzzes. Hmm. What do we take as the function for combination? Well, we could use string concatenation. That happens to be plus plus. How does it look like? Oh, I'll give it a name right away. So this is our pattern equals that. And is, if we ask the pattern, this is a fizz, this is a buzz, fizz, fizz, buzz. And if I have my cursor here, so right, if, if position 15, it's fizz, buzz. OK, that looks good. Now we have the numbers. Remember? And we have the pattern. And now we need to combine the number and the pattern. How do we do this? Zip width? OK. Hmm. Now comes an interesting observation. It's kind of a clever trick that was not mine, but Kevlin Henney. And um, we can use an if for figuring out the empty string. And so that was my attempt. But he said, you know what? Every string that only contains digits is always considered bigger than the empty string. And every string that only contains digits is always considered smaller than a string that starts with an alpha character. So actually, if we only take the maximum function, we, already, we are already set, you know? If we say fizzbuzz equals zip width 
maximum, the numbers and the pattern <laughs> fizz buzz one two fizz four buzz fizz seven and fizz so and so we get the first so and so many the first fifteen I guess and yeah fizz buzz is, <laughs> is left out anyway so now we have to print one hundred of those well we have an endless an infinite stream and now we can slice out of that stream the portion that we want and print it. Now, for the first time, we do something that has an effect. And we do it with a function called for. For takes something and then prints and then does something to what we iterate over. <laughs> print then. So what do we iterate over? 100, oh sorry, we are taking the first 100 of the FISPAS, right? Here you go. Or we can drop 100, we can use any other kind of slice. That's the only piece of that solution where, uh, where we actually have an effect. Bless you. So how does it look like um, in, if we compare? Here comes the thing. You could say, well, uh, Dirk is playing clever tricks here. You know, he made up this special example, especially so. No, I did not. Actually, the, the, the steps that I showed you were exactly the steps that I went through the first time I had the, um, and I made this implementation in Frege. It's the natural thing to do. Anyway, if you compare these solutions, here is the FISPA solution, you will see. Well, in the imperative code, there are four conditionals. In the logical code, there is no conditional, not a single one. If you would do the if thing, you would have one. Where do bugs come from in my code from conditionals? You know, with this five thing in short-term memory, therefore. We have seven operators in the imperative code. We have the plus plus in the logical code. Whereas, you know, plus plus really is the function. We use it as a function, not as an operator. But I give you that one. Okay. The nesting le level of ifs is three. So cyclomatic complexity is three, if not four, because it's in for loop. So it should actually be one higher. There is no nesting whatsoever in the imperative, in the logical code. The sequencing, it's extremely sensible to correct sequencing of these checks, right? If you do the 15 in the end, you'll have an error. This you can do in any permutation of the lines, if you want. How about maintainability? Well, go back. Let's say um, we don't want to go to a system out print line, we'd like to put it in a database four places where we have to change the code, right? Not so good. Let's say we have a new requirement coming up. Every seventh number should be DevOps. Oh, can you imagine what you need to do? The multiples of three and five, and the multiples of three and seven, and the multiples of three and five and seven, in the correct order. Oh no, I forgot the multiples of five and seven. You know, see that? This is really, really bad. What here? Well, you have another cycle, you have another, another zip. It's like business rules. And it comes natural. You know? By the way, when we created this code, we went like, we did this first, but it makes no difference. So we created this one line at a go, incrementally. At no point in time do we have to go back and change existing code. At no point in time do we have to go back and even compile it. We do not even have to compile the existing code that we have first written. This is incremental development. Here, any time you do any change, you have to recompile everything. You have to touch everything, you have to recompile everything. 
Not so good for incremental development. Incremental development is the big thing. Because how do we create code? One line at a time. And if we make non-intrusive changes, only adding to things, not touching the other thing, not changing it, not even recompiling it, what can we break? Nothing. That is big. That is, in my eyes, the big thing about functional programming that is kind of undermarketed. So, what is unique in Frege, global type inference? That we have purity by default, and if we opt out of the purity, it becomes visible in the type system, it's explicit. And therefore, we can detect purity by the absence of the effects. We are lazy by default. Our values are all automatically immutable because there are no assignments. And our guarantees even extend into Java calls. And all these points are, in my eyes, unique to Frege as a JVM language. There are other languages outside the JVM, and there are a few languages inside the JVM that nobody knows of that have similar effects, but here it is. And why do we care to have these kinds of characteristics? Because it makes our code robust, the pure code robust, under parallel execution. We can go safely parallel without even thinking. The compiler can do it. The IDE can suggest a refactoring for doing it. It is robust under composition because of the values, because of immutable values. When you have a function, a method in Java that takes a string and returns something, how long do you consider whether that is safe or not? Not for the fraction of a second, you know? Because, you know, I give in a string, it cannot mess with my string. Well, technically it can, but yeah, nobody does it. Okay, so. If you have a method that takes a list, ah, maybe it does something to the list. You know? If you put over a person object, oh, maybe it changes the person object somehow. You don't know. It is robust under increments, as we have seen. It is robust. It gives you a whole myriad of new refactorings that you can apply by equational reasoning. We can suddenly reuse what the computational science people have given us over the last 25 years, and we have mainly ignored it. If you're interested in that kind of thing, um, I did run in a tutorial, 90-minute tutorial, where I have a little bit more time at Java 1. It's, um, it's available online somewhere, and uh, I go into this a little bit deeper at that point. And because we're in this world where we have to, we have no other chance, we have to work in a functional way, that's the best way to learn functional programming, even if we later go back into our Java, whatever language we have, and apply our developer discipline, you know, I, I'm pretty sure you want to do this. Anyway, so learning is much better done in the pure environment. It's like, you want to learn English, go to England. Don't talk any German word anymore <laughs> for the next few weeks. If you come back later, you will have much better results than changing all the time. The best way to learn functional programming. And of course, it's just a pleasure to work with. Now, everybody says this about his language. But here it's true. <laughs> How do you learn it? Well, you can use any resource that explains Haskell to you. You learn Haskell, and you get Frege for free. You can learn two for one. How good is that? You can use the books, you can use the videos, you can use the um, massive open online course by Eric Meyer. You should sign up tonight for that one, because tomorrow is the deadline for the first homework. <laughs> it, it started mid-October. You can still sign up. And I urge you to do this. It is a rather difficult, it's not 101, it's more than 101. But you will, it's difficult and it's tiresome, but you will learn functional programming, I promise. So it, it's on the edX platform, which is like Coursera, but non-commercial. You can go to the homepage, and there's also some specifics about Frege and the Frege Goodness free ebook um, 
that you will find on the home page as well. And all the typical channels are also listed on the home page. I'm pretty sure there's going to be lots of questions. Um, first, please provide feedback in case you liked the talk. If you didn't, you know that pe feedback thing is not so important anymore. Anyway. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm happy to take questions and because I know m some of your questions, you know, this brain reading thing from the beginning, I already compiled some. It's not the frequently asked questions, it is the frequent, most frequently given answers <laughs> from here, right? Um, Frege is implementing Haskell as in the Haskell report 2010. This is the standard for Haskell. And yes, we have permission from the Haskell people to call ourselves Haskell. Actually, Simon Peyton Jones, a lot of people in the room will know him, he urged us to call ourselves Haskell because he, he said, you, arguably, you're even more Haskell than the Glasgow Haskell compiler because you're much more closer to the standard. We deviate from the standard where it comes to what's called the foreign function interface in Haskell, which is the native declarations in Frege. Otherwise, take your Haskell code, run it in Frege, pretty much um, unmodified, or only modifications where it's absolutely obvious. Um, how is performance is a usual question. Performance is really good because the Java code that we spit out is mainly you know, immutable data types and everything's final and everything's static. You know, the, the JIT just loves it. So we are roughly same speed as Java. When you do micro benchmarks, you will see quite a lot of deviation from that. If you want to learn more about that, I can dive into that. Compiler is reasonably fast, particularly when used through the Eclipse plugin, where everything is hot and warm. You know, the compiler is written in Frege, so it needs the JVM, and if you do have JVM startup times and so for the compiler. So if it's hot, it's better. Uh, we do have Maven, Gradle, Bazel, Make, Leinigen integration for the build tools. Um, some people like to ask, do you have a hash, <laughs> hash array map to try? Yes, we have. We call it hash map. <laughs> do we have testing support? Yes, we have quick checkers in there in the exact same way that it is in Haskell, including the shrinking thing, if you know that. So it's, it's rather advanced. Do you have software transactional memory? Not yet, it's currently in the works. Do you have more questions than that? We have eight minutes. Oh, what a luxury. Yes, please. Uh, I learned functional pro programming from Scala, and um, I came here to learn about Haskell. And how does it compare to Scala? Does it have uh, some features Scala does not have? Was it, is it uh, more so, so the question was, how does it compare? Uh, people in the room, who knows Scala? Who is do doing some Scala? Like everybody, thank you. <laughs> Good. So what, what's different? So everything that is unique in Frege is obviously different from Scala, right? <laughs> this is not meant as a joke. This is, I mean, um, uh, go back. Yeah. Here you see the main difference. Scala is, is in, it is, I, I was about to say an attempt. No, it's more than an attempt. It is, it is an achievement in trying to combine functional programming and object-oriented programming. So you have, for example, subtyping and parametric polymorphism at the same time, which leads to all this covariance and contravariance thing that I never quite understood, but maybe me, you know. So in, in Frege and Haskell, there are no subtypes, and therefore you have no variance problems with that. So it's, it's different. You can, Scala is immensely powerful, right? By mixing everything, but also kind of, you know, that adds to complexity, obviously. And uh, Frege is the thing, you can combine it, but keep it separate, you know? Object-oriented, fine, but here we do the clean thing that, that you know, even, 
even th th these green ones, these green blue ones. You can even see this as an architecture thing, you know? Have your Java, Scala, Clojure, whatever over here, and there's Frege, and you call it as a service, right? This is the typical way of integrating it. Passing it a string, returning a string, passing it an array, returning an array, and then being pure and signed. Does it address the question? Not fully, I understand. <laughs> yes, sir. More questions? I've got, uh, yes, please. Question. Now, tell the first one. Okay. The first one is uh, how much the compiler is clever. I mean, uh, the GHT, GHT, the compiler from Haskell, is really, really clever. So, how does it compare uh, to the second one? So, the, the point was well, the GHC, which has been the classical Haskell compiler, the main compiler for Haskell, there's many compilers, yeah. but it is the most advanced one, I would say. Thousands of compiler options that you can use. Um, how does it compare to the Frege compiler? Well, first, well, there's, there's a wiki page for that, <laughs> but um, from the thousands, literally thousands of options that you have in GHC, which go far beyond um, Haskell Report 2010, we pick one selection, one opinionated selection, and implement that one. Okay, so feature-wise, we are just a tiny bit of this. Uh, Performance-wise, how how fast is it? Now we have a master student currently at Canoe who's doing the parallelism stuff, and we have benchmarks where Frege is considerably slower, but we also have benchmarks where Frege is considerably faster, like four times faster than native compiled Haskell, two times faster than native optimized Java, for, ex for the Mandelbrot set, for example. So this is kind of an exotic data point, but, but it gives you the feeling, you know? It is, um, it's not only from a logical standpoint a good thing to do, it is also from an engineering standpoint really well engineered. You know, we, we take advantage of both, of the, of the crispiness and of the, of, of the mm, cleanliness of the design of Haskell, and the engineering effort that went into the JVM. So we combine this. I guess it's a pretty good story. You have a second question. Okay, the second question is, uh, what do you think about the laziness part? I mean, I mean in, in Haskell, personally, I've got a lot, it gives me a lot of trouble to think hmm. about. That. Okay, so question is, how, what, what I do think about the lazy thing. Because many people have trouble with laziness you do other considerations. It's certainly one of those pieces where the blue pill and the red pill deviate much. I must say that I understand that people have sometimes difficulties, especially in the beginning, because you have to unlearn lots of considerations that you did before, like in FISPAS. Here. Ah, oh, an infinite list that's infinite long, and another one that's infinite long, and we'll make a new line that's infinite long. <gasps> oh, that's going to cost so much, it will eat up all my memory. No. It will not eat up your memory, because there's only two lists created, one of length three and one of length five, and no other list has ever been created. It's lazily created its values when it needs to. Except this four, what, what we see here is more like an iterator, right? And this is what I love about laziness. It gives you automatic, automatic fusion. In all other languages, fusion is an optimization technique. With laziness, you get it for free. And laziness is the thing that keeps the language on its path. You know, when you have laziness, you cannot make deal with the devil and go with side effects and whatever, right? because that wouldn't work anymore. This is the thing that keeps you on track. And therefore, well, the li life is not always the best for everybody, <laughs> but uh, I personally like it pretty much. Okay, look, because, uh, for example, in Haskell, you could have uh, a large amount of uh, terms that are not uh, executed, so sometimes you need to add the strictness annotation for them. It, yeah, so there's sometimes for optimization you need strictness annotations, uh, and yes, we have them as well. You just make an exclamation mark in front of your argument, and then you have it. 
it's, it's possible. But it's one of those concerns when it comes to, is it practical or not? And some people may say, because of this, it's not practical. And I say, because of this, it's practical. You know, your mileage may vary. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>